1977, my wife and I had been married just a couple of years, uh, and we started a new church, uh, Good Shepherd Community Church, and it was a, a thrill to be part of it. I was only 22 years old. Uh, Stu Weber, my fellow pastor, was the, the old guy at 31 years old, and we started this church and had a lot of people in it from the beginning that were great. Things were going terrifically. It was all the excitement of a new church. And if you would have asked me then, 40 years ago, where will you be in another 40 years, I would have said, I hope I'll still be a pastor at Good Shepherd Community Church. God had other plans. Uh, God had other plans that took me out of pastoral ministry completely. Uh, and had I known that, I probably would have objected to it. Uh, but what happened was we opened our home to a girl who uh, was pregnant and she had had an abortion in her past and we had the uh, privilege and delight of seeing her come to faith in Christ as she was living with us. And then uh, we helped her place her child for adoption, which was her uh, preference. And several years after that, I was asked to join the board of the first uh, crisis pregnancy center, that's what they were called then, in the Pacific Northwest. Several years after that, as I'd been involved in a lot of pro-life work over the years, uh, God laid it on my heart to do something pretty radical, uh, to do peaceful, nonviolent, civil disobedience at abortion clinics. Uh, there were people all over the country that were doing this at the time. It was fashioned after the civil rights movement. Uh, we were trying to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. As scripture says, defend the rights of the poor and needy, rescue those who are being led to slaughter. This is what the Bible said. And I felt like as a follower of Jesus and as a pastor, it was my responsibility and, and my calling uh, to do something about the slaughter of unborn children and the women who were being manipulated and lied to by the abortion clinics and Planned Parenthood and all that. So um, standing in front of the doors of abortion clinics, giving alternatives, encouraging them to visit the uh, what we now call the pregnancy resource centers uh, instead and, and just uh, give your baby life, but let your baby live and that will be not only in your child's best interest, it'll be in your best interest because nobody wants to live with the guilt of having taken the life of an innocent child. And we saw so many moms who were suffering from the consequences of abortion. So we're doing this, well, this is not a popular thing to do. It, it's against the law because we're impeding access uh, to a business. Uh, when we were taken to court, one of the lawyers of an abortion clinic uh, argued in front of the judge, uh, my clients have just as much right to perform abortions as McDonald's does to serve hamburgers. And that was, that was the logic. And the human rights aspect of things was not taken into consideration. So felt the calling to stand up and to do this. Uh, as a result, uh, I was uh, arrested uh, seven different times at different ones of these rescues or protests or whatever you want to call them. And uh, then I stood before various judges and one judge said, I'm going to um, put you in jail for a couple of days. I'm sentencing you to a couple of days and that's not very much, a couple of days. Immediately after the judge found me guilty and pronounced the sentence, uh, they put the cuffs on my wrists and on my ankles and the chain connecting them and heavy chain and making a lot of noise and there's flash photography, the cameras are going all around me, newspaper and all of that and they led me off. And so this was a new experience. This is not something that I had uh, gone through in the past. I came to Christ when I was a, a teenager, grew up in a non-Christian home, but I was used to people trusting me. I, I'd been a good student, I'd been an athlete, um, you know, people trusted me, but here I was now, a criminal, and uh, then I was uh, taken into the jail. And I was having my meals with guys that wanted to uh, trade two pancakes for a couple of pieces of bacon, and I'm going, sure, whatever you want, it's fine with me. Uh, and then I'm going into my cell, and I'm sitting there alone, and trying to figure out 
what, you know, how did this happen? How did I get here? Lord, what do you have planned? When I was processed into the jail, uh, we were told to take all our clothes off. We were strip searched, a dozen men, uh, and it was uh, a humiliation that I had never experienced. Uh, it was really kind of a, the closest I had ever come to a dehumanization. And, and again, yeah, just a couple of days, but that initial shock of entering this other world, which God used in my life to, to, to humble me, uh, to remind me that there's a lot of the world that doesn't live with the advantages that I have had. And there's a lot of people, some guilty, some innocent, who have you know, gone through this. Another situation that was very humbling was that when I was brought into the jail, I had had my diabetic equipment with me, but it wasn't available at that point. I was insulin dependent diabetic and uh, subject to high blood sugars and low blood sugars. And I had a low blood sugar. And so I had to request, uh, you know, granola bar or something with some enough sugar in it to bring my blood sugar up because I, I could feel I was going lower and lower. And so uh, they didn't believe me. They thought this is just a ploy, you know. Again, I was used to being trusted and then they took me in uh, to uh, this nurse and this nurse looked at me and said, what are you in here for? And I explained it was peaceful, nonviolent, civil disobedience at an abortion clinic. And she says, she looked at me very uh, hatefully and said, tell me you're a rapist, tell me you're a murderer, but don't tell me you're in here because of that, because that makes me mad. And then she said, I don't believe you, I don't think you're having a low blood sugar. And so she t had some equipment there and she left it on for two minutes instead of one minute. She didn't know how to even use the equipment and so it didn't show that I had a low blood sugar, but I did, I had a serious one. And I said, okay, I I'm just telling you, it's probably not going to be good for either of us if I pass out. And I'm probably within a few minutes of passing out. So she went over to the coffee pot, grabbed some sugar, and threw it at me. And it bounced off me, and I'm picking it up, and I'm opening these little sugar packs to get my blood sugar up. And I'm thinking, Lord, how did I even get here? How did I enter this world with all of these crazy things happening? Uh, well, uh, the uh, lawsuit that was brought against us, there were several lawsuits, but one that was brought against us uh, required me resigning from pastoral ministry because um, they brought a $19,000 judgment against me and uh, the others that were involved in this protest, and they could get it from any of us, and so they were coming after me to get it from me and uh, I had to resign so that my church no longer owed me any money because one fourth of my wages were going to be garnished each month and so the church was going to have to write out a check to an abortion clinic. Uh, and this is something that I couldn't live with and I didn't want to put the church through that. So by now, I can no longer be a pastor and my uh, picture is on the front page of the Sunday Oregonian, which back then was a, a big deal and people are seeing me and people that went to high school with me, they don't understand, you know, why am I even doing this? Because the, you know, newspaper and the media never gave accurate explanations. And I thought, okay, so things were going so well for me in the first 13 years of the church and now we had our offices and we had our church building and had all the support staff i was making a very good wage and suddenly now just in my mid 30s i could no longer be a pastor i could no longer it was the death of a dream uh, and so what am i going to do now so in God's providence, uh, he, he led me to, I'd done some writing already, start a ministry called Eternal Perspective Ministries uh, to continue to write. And we committed ourselves from the very beginning to give away 100% of the royalties uh, to Christian ministries all over the world. And that was, a, I hope, a, a decision that was motivated by generosity, but there was also the motivation to keep abortion clinics from getting any of it either. So this is what happened. And as a result of that, we start this ministry. 
And it was a classic case of Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, where Joseph says to his brothers, you intended it for evil when they had betrayed him and sold him to slavery in Egypt. You intended it for evil, but God intended it for good to save many lives. So we became very active as a ministry uh, in pro-life concerns. I actually did far more uh, for the benefit of the unborn than I was able to do when I was a pastor. So one of the first books I wrote after we started our ministry was called Pro-Life Answers to Pro-Choice Arguments, a book that sold well over 100,000 copies and was used widely to train uh, pro-life people to uh, speak up for uh, the unborn, for those who couldn't speak for themselves. So the book started selling very well uh, on the bestsellers list, wrote more of them, fiction and nonfiction and children's books. And we've sold about uh, 10 million copies of my books and been able to support ministries at very substantial rates all over the world. So God brought great good out of it. It was Romans 8, 28. It was God causing all things to work together for good to those who love him. But at the time, at first, it didn't look like things were working for good. It was the death of my dream. It was humbling. It was people questioning my motives and saying, are you really doing the best thing for your family? Why would you do such a radical thing? Your daughters need you and here you are doing this thing and getting arrested and going to jail. And, and, and what kind of an example are you being? And it was a great test for me and for my wife of thinking of God as the audience of one, uh, a, a, a God of love and grace and sovereignty and goodness who had called us to something that didn't make us popular, uh, not only among unbelievers, but among many Christians who felt we were doing the wrong thing. I was doing the wrong thing. But God brought to my heart and to my mind 1 uh, Peter 2 where it says Christ entrusted himself to him who judges justly. And when I sat in courtrooms where uh, the judge was clearly despising uh, us and making comments to the jury about how they needed to find us guilty, he, he did what was called a directed verdict told them they had no choice but to find us guilty um, and to punish us as uh, to a degree that we would never do anything like this again. We heard abortion clinic uh, employees sit on the, uh, up there under oath and say that we called women sluts and whores and pushed them and shouted at them and pulled their hair and screamed at them, none of which was true at all. And so you're hearing all these false accusations that are being repeated by the newspapers and they're on television and you're going okay Lord I am getting a little taste just a little taste of what it means to be a follower of Jesus and to realize that your reputation is not in your control anymore but God knows God is the true Supreme Court and he knows what we learned from that what our family learned from that what we learned from me owning nothing legally anymore, from giving away millions and millions of dollars to God's work all over the world. I could only make a uh, minimum wage for 20 years uh, because anything beyond that could be garnished by an abortion clinic and we couldn't allow that to happen. And to learn the joys of generosity and, and following Jesus and, and having just that small taste of a life that didn't go the way you planned it, but a life that went a better way than the way that you planned it. So while we were humanly disappointed naturally at no longer being able to be a pastor, which was my dream job, no longer being able to do a number of the things that I'd been able to do before, but instead now doing other things that God had a plan for, and I learned, and my family learned to trust him. And our daughters, to go through it with us was, was one of the, the most beautiful things. So here are daughters who other people were concerned, are you doing you know, the right thing, the best thing for them? 
not only are joining us in prayer, but they are sensing the wisdom and leading of God and really speaking to us, their parents, through what God was revealing to them. Because one of the things we told them was, you know, if we lose this lawsuit, and we probably will, we don't know whether uh, this house will be taken from us. We don't know whether you'll be unable to go to your church school anymore because it's a private school. It costs money. And um, if we have to continue to make minimum wage, uh, we just don't know what's going to happen. So we had to kind of warn them fairly about this, and they still agreed to it. And I thought, here are little girls, which in their own little world, they're making uh, a substantial sacrifice out of trust in God because they know it's the right thing to do. And so to this day, I look back at that and I think how God worked in their lives and how God worked in our family as a result of things we never would have chosen for ourselves, but which God knew was best for us. So maybe you're looking at something that's happened in your life. Uh, maybe you had a dream and it died, and maybe you've had several dreams that have died, and maybe you've had relationships that you had set your hopes in, and you've been crushed, and things have not gone your way, and maybe even terrible tragedies have happened. But I think what we need to realize is that we can only see so far in front of us. Um, and it's kind of like this. But God sees all the way down the line. And I think it's that great promise of Romans 8.28. God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, in the short run, you often can't see what good is going to come out of this. One thing I recommend that people do, I heard somebody say this many years ago, I recommend people sit down and they take a, a piece of paper and on one side write down the worst things that have ever happened to them and then turn it over and on the other side write down the best things that have ever happened. And now, look at how many of the things that are on the best things list that would not or could not have happened apart from a number of the things on the worst things list. Well, the older you get, and I'm old enough now that I can look back and see in retrospect many of the things that happened, which for the first year after they happened, the first five years, the first 10 years, I couldn't really see what good God could bring out of them. But I now see the good that God has already brought out of them. And I think God graciously allows us to see him bring good out of bad things in our lives in certain situations in order to encourage us to trust what he's told us in his word, that he's actually going to cause all things to work together for our good. And one day in retrospect, maybe not for all things in this life, but when we're with him in eternity, then we'll be able to look back and we'll be able to see the truth having been fulfilled that God really did cause all things to work together for good in the lives of us, his children, who he loves with all of his heart. And I think sometimes when we question the providence and the love of God, we should maybe envision ourselves standing before the Lord, which indeed we will do one day. And uh, if we have that question, God, do you really love me? I mean, truly, do you really love me? I could just see him reaching out those hands with the scars and saying, do these look like the hands of a God who does not care? Do these look like the hands of a God who does not love you fully? So we see in 2 Corinthians 4 that God says these light and momentary afflictions are achieving for us an eternal weight of glory that far outweighs them all. Now, it may not seem light, it may not seem momentary, but think of the Apostle Paul who wrote those words. His own sufferings were very substantial. There's a long list of those in 2 Corinthians 10 and 11 and all of the bad things that happened in his life. 
But he wasn't just saying someday all those bad things will be behind us. He was saying that those things are achieving for us an eternal weight of glory, that God is using for good in our lives in terms of our spiritual maturity, our Christ-likeness, becoming more like Jesus. So that passage in 2 Corinthians 4 goes on to say in verse 18, we look not at the things which are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And that's really the key verse of our ministry, eternal perspective ministries. We need to realize that this life on earth is a, a dot. And it begins, it ends, it's brief. But from that dot extends a line that will go on forever without end. All of us live right now in the dot. We don't have any choice. That's where we are in the dot. But if we're smart, we're not going to live for the dot. We're going to live for the line. We're going to live in light of eternity.